I'm Deanna Pennington from El Paso, Texas. Uh, this is part two of a four-part video series. And in this particular video, I'm gonna try to give you some standard vocabulary. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the vocabulary that we use in my project. If you'll recall from part one of the video, we talked about the background of this line of research on knowledge integration across disciplines. We talked a little bit about the empirical studies of science research teams. I presented interdisciplinary research teams as distributed cognitive systems with feedbacks and emergent properties. And I highlighted that knowledge integration is an emergent property that is going to come out of your interactions through time and is not something that you start out with or that you can um, force to happen immediately. So if you think about, you have a researcher, they're the black dots. You have a research goal, that's the white dots. And the arrows try to illustrate the relationship between the researchers and their goals. In disciplinary research, you have three researchers and they all have their own goals. And there's no, no real interaction between them. They could be working in the same room next to each other, but there's nothing, no relationship between their research. Multidisciplinary, you take those same three researchers, they're doing exactly the same research that they would do, but they're doing it under a thematic umbrella and they're sharing information. Typically the way this works out is people are doing their work, they have some sort of seminar that they present their research in. If the disciplines are really diverse, then people don't have enough background to really understand much of the other person's seminar. So that's multidisciplinary. A lot of the empirical data says that most research teams that call themselves interdisciplinary are really multidisciplinary. So what is interdisciplinary? Well, in interdisciplinarity, you have a shared research goal and everybody's contributing to it. And you begin to develop some interdependencies between projects. So they're not all doing exactly the same thing they would have done working by themselves. Now they're, now they're starting to uh, give input to each other's work and develop those dependencies. Transdisciplinary is that you're now doing research with people outside of academia, where you bring in people who are scholars, but they maybe don't conduct research or they conduct research in applied areas and you start using them to help design and conceive of the research that you're going to be doing. Transdisciplinary is actually used a second way in the literature, and that's when the interdisciplinary research community develops so many linkages and it evolves so far that it develops an entirely new discipline. So an example of that might be biochemistry or bioinformatics. There are many others you can probably think of. They interact long enough that they become essentially their own discipline with their own terminology and their own conceptual frameworks. Now there's this new term that I want to explain to you because you're likely hearing it a lot. Convergence is most related to transdisciplinary, potentially but not necessarily including stakeholders. They either want disciplines working together within academia who are really have worked together long enough that they're converging on new conceptual frameworks, new paradigms, new disciplines that could tackle problems that have not been tackled very effectively in the past by one discipline. Or they also include working with stakeholders in the community uh, and non-academic areas um, to try to converge on uh, solutions that will have high societal impact. So those are the two ways they're using that term. It didn't originate with the NSF. It actually came out of some prior reports that came out that talked about convergence. This quote, convergence is a new integrated approach for achieving advances. So you're probably wondering, What's new about this? We've been doing transdisciplinary research for a couple of decades, so what's new about this? Well, here's what NSF says. He said it's research driven by a specific and compelling problem. It requires deep integration across disciplines, 
and intermingling of knowledge, theories, methods, data, communities, languages that will lead to new frameworks, new paradigms, or even new disciplines. And convergence research is a means of solving vexing research problems, in particular, complex problems focused on societal needs. So again, you may be wondering, well, okay, what's new about this? Because it sounds like what we've been doing. I think when we talk about multi or inter or transdisciplinary teams, we're talking, of, our focus is on the makeup of the teams. We're looking at what are the disciplines involved? You know, how well are they integrating across disciplines? It's really looking at the makeup and the structure of the team. My take on it is that when you switch to talking about convergent research, you're switching from looking at the team to thinking more about the process and the outcome. The team is converging. You're not talking about what disciplines they're from. You're just talking about, are they converging or not? Do they have a process that will lead to convergence? And you're focused on that outcome. Is the outcome really convergent or is it just multidisciplinary? Everybody did their own thing. So I kind of like that. I like the shift in focus off of the structure of the team and onto the process, primarily because the Embers project that I'm working on and leading, we are working on a theory and evidence-based process for engaging across disciplines so that you can more effectively reach convergent research outcomes. You don't just become transdisciplinary overnight. You don't put people in a room and say, okay, be transdisciplinary. Oh, do convergent research. It doesn't happen that way. You start multidisciplinary. You have to start multidisciplinary. You can't start anywhere else because you have to build those linkages that will allow you to move to interdisciplinary and then ultimately into transdisciplinary. So that's why that process point of view is really, really important. Even though people may come together and say, we're going to do convergent research, figuring out what that is is half of the problem. Once you've figured it out what it is, then you can do the research. But this is called an ill-structured problem or a wicked problem. You've probably heard that at Sysync, where figuring out how to approach the problem is harder, oftentimes, than solving it once you figure that out. So our perspective on it is that it's a learning problem. And in the Embers project, we draw on a bunch of learning theories. We also draw on social science theories and there's some communication science theories that we draw on. But we start really with this fundamental understanding that it's a learning problem and that if we're gonna make progress, if we're gonna come up with a process, it needs to be based on learning theories. These are some theories that we uh, make use of. We're not gonna go over all of these. If you've had any background in education, you'll probably recognize some of them. In constructivism, you're, you're constructing mental models on the fly all the time. In experiential learning, you're learning from your experiences. Transformative learning, oftentimes it's very disorienting to go into one of these groups. And uh, transformative learning theory talks about how to deal with disorientation, how you make sense out of a world that doesn't make sense to you. Model-based reasoning and distributed cognitive systems, that's coming out of two different fields, but it's talking about the same thing. It's about this notion that we offload our mental models. We, we learn and we think and we understand the world and make sense out of it by mental modeling. And that if you offload those mental models into some sort of tangible form like diagrams, that that helps you make sense of the world. Models, those could be anything. It could, it could be analogies. Anytime you simplify the world around you, you're making a model out of it, whether it's a mental model or whether it's a physical model. A metaphor is a model. Thought experiments, those are models. You're abstracting and communicating complex concepts. Research in education talks about the, it's that offloading that helps and, and, and it helps you grasp and manipulate more information because you're offloading some of it. Uh, but there's been a, some groundbreaking work in cognitive science by Nersestian. And she has really studied scientists themselves and engineers. She says that the, the creation, the, the act of making these models, tangible models, invokes conceptual change. So everybody's heard the saying, a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, yes, this is, it is. 
uh, if you already know what you're thinking about, but if you're trying to figure something out, the act of creating that visualization or that picture or that image or that diagram, the act of creating it causes you to think differently about your problem. So she talks about it as reasoning by mental modeling aided by external devices. And there's convergence on this across multiple disciplines. They call them different things. In the social sciences, they call them boundary objects. In anthropology, they call them material artifacts. In the organizational sciences, they call them epistemic objects. In psychology, they're talking about macro cognition with external representations. So from a whole variety of research directions, people are converging on this notion that you, if you intentionally and purposefully design a process that includes mental modeling and reasoning with external devices, that there, that facilitates being able to generate new integrated conceptualizations across disciplines. So our terminology that we use in our project draws on all those different fields, but we had to settle on a particular term. So we're using the social science terminology because it's very pervasive in the literature we talk about boundaries. Disciplines have boundaries around the areas that they approach. A boundary is a conceptual space within which one person is working. And of course, if you're working across disciplines, you've got people with different boundaries and you're trying to overcome those boundaries and, and bridge across those boundaries. A boundary object is a physical artifact that enables work across those boundaries without requiring individuals to cross those boundaries. There's a whole, like a ton of research that's been happening on boundary objects as these things that allow information to flow across disciplines. But the reality is that that doesn't happen from the beginning. You may be able to build something like that through time, but at first, when you're first starting to work together, there are, there are no boundary objects in existence. You have to try to create those. So you can think about an integrated conceptualization, an integrated framework that's a product of working together that then can become a boundary object. But first you have to generate it. And so there's been some research on boundary negotiating objects. So this is a boundary object that facilitates negotiating across the boundaries to be crossed and how they can be crossed. And so you negotiate that boundary object that's gonna let you cross the boundaries of different disciplines. And boundary negotiating then is the reasoning process and the discourse process, uh, the discursive discussion that, that happens that uh, is intended to lead to uh, an understanding of the interactions between those disciplines and uh, the ways in which you can cross the boundaries of the individuals at hand. So that's our language that we use. You'll be hearing a lot more of it. Boundary negotiating, boundary negotiating objects, a boundary object and boundaries.